What's up, guys? Welcome back to Decently Indecent, episode 29. Let's talk about the U.S. election. <laughs> no, I'm only, I'm only kidding. Kind of. Um, listen, this is episode 29, and uh, I just want to go over a couple things today, drop a little bit of news on you, um, talk about the podcast, talk about the next couple months heading into the winter, and... <clears throat> just to kind of pull your ear for a minute, if you'll have me. I was just uh, watching the Donald Trump Rogan podcast. It just dropped before I actually, I got maybe about an hour into it. It dropped about two and a half, three hours ago. Um, it's obviously been a highly anticipated episode and that's fear of the world. Um, you know, I listened to Rogan off and on over the years and, I think it's a pretty decent forum to hear people just hear people talk and kind of in a relaxed manner. So I thought it would be interesting. The first hour is it's been okay. Um, you know, I don't. You guys that know me, I think know that I don't have a particular fervor or passion for politics one way or the other. Um, I do think we're at an interesting time in the United States because of how partisan has become whether or not you're leaning one way or the other i i it just feels kind of uneasy this particular election cycle and maybe it feels like this every time i don't feel like it did though you know decades ago 10 20 years ago i think in 2020 it started to ramp up and now this one feels especially kind of on edge and it, it it feels like there's no coming back right if it, it feels like moving forward it it will continue to escalate every four years during the election cycle as both the the left and the right the two-party system continues to become more estranged from one another which feels shitty and i'm not i'm not a doomsday prepper but i do theorize sometimes in my brain, uh, you know, situations in which there was some sort of structural and uh, societal integrity check, you know? It's weird, you know? We're living in strange times where a lot of the old systems don't work and are broken because I think largely in part due to how the dissemination of information has changed and how the whole infrastructure of information consumption has changed. Fast-paced cell phone breaking minute news is now in everyone's pocket as opposed to people sitting down at 5 p.m. to turn on their television around dinner time, you know, just 20 years ago, whatever it was. And I think the, our political infrastructures and our, just our system of governance hasn't really caught up to that. And maybe, I don't know if it's much about like it catching up as much as it really pulling back the veil a little bit on a lot of things where, <laughs> we get to see the true nature of the beast, you know? It's perplexing. I want to just uh, first, firstly say, you know, if you're here with me uh, right now, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. This is 29 episodes. That's a pretty good click. Um, going into the, the fall or well into the fall now, coming on the end of October, November's around the corner. Episode 29, this is going to be, I think it's going to mark the, the end of chapter, excuse me, the, the end of season one for me. What is my season one of the Decently Indecent podcast? And I don't know, you know, I came into this not really knowing exactly what direction I wanted to take. Um, I think, you know, I initially had some guests on who I was, um, people from my from my years in YouTube that I've gotten to know that I really enjoyed talking to, um, that I think were really great episodes in hindsight. And then I started to lean more into solo episodes because I realized the nature of, you know, being a one man operation, running multiple YouTube channels and trying to book people everywhere. It's just, I, I think part of me bit off a little bit more than I could chew and that I could manage on my own. And I'll be, you know, I have, and don't get me wrong. Like I have obviously my guy, Christian, who, who adds for me, who does a great job and just some of the administrative stuff. So it started to turn into some more, some solo episodes, which I've enjoyed doing as well, but I'm at a point where I want to, I think I need more clarity. I feel like I'm pretty decent in this format, the longer form format, 
where you're talking a little bit more in depth about things and you're getting a little more candid and, and real. And it's more about, you know, depth instead of width is from a content perspective, which is what podcasts are. And that's not for everybody all the time, but you know, over the course of these 29 episodes, I've gotten a lot of comments from you guys that have been really positive and really appreciative of me sharing some parts of my life that I wouldn't normally talk about on, on my other YouTube channels. And that's been really great. It's given me an opportunity to appreciate that the beauty of content that is just made for the sake of something greater than just optimizing it for views and retention, right? Which I've spoken about before, but it's easy to get lost in the machine that is a content business, an attention business. And, you know, attention waxes and wanes. And I've been fortunate in my career thus far through the ups and downs I've had to be able to continue doing what I'm doing. And I'm always thinking about what that, what that next thing is for me. And for, for the podcast, I know initially when I started, I had grandiose dreams of wanting to become some, something more like, like an unsubscribe podcast, but like the new England chapter where it's always IRL, maybe multiple co-hosts and we bring people in and we do a bigger show. And I still have dreams of doing that. I just need more clarity on how I'm going to get there. And full disclosure, I, I'm having, I've been like, before I was listening to the podcast earlier tonight, I was, I was online. I've been thinking nonstop for months over years about uh, just getting a separate parcel of property to start to build sort of a media hub. Um, and, you know, so I've been looking at like warehouse type things that I could turn into some sort of uh, kind of mini studio because I just, I feel uncomfortable trying to make my, you know, I, everything I do right now is outside of my house. So I obviously have a detached garage, which I work in my office above the, the garage. But if I were to do something that was more involved and had more people coming in and out, I just don't think I would want it at my home. So I'm looking into the future, the next three, six, 12 months and beyond what that next chapter looks like for me, not only for longer form podcasting stuff, but just in general, wanting to expand what I do with, with my wife, um, to, to take the lush life channel and, and continue doing the, the, the easy reaction stuff, but to do something a little more prolific, um, in, in the vein of stuff that, that hits home a little bit more. Uh, for us, maybe like fitness, I've thought, uh, you know, part of part of the warehouse, I, I have this dream of building like uh, a small gym in there where I could start to do interesting and fun content with my wife based around that part of our life, which has become pretty significant. I'd build like a golf simulator to do like fun shit for Instagram that I think would be fun around golf during the winter because obviously you can't do golf content during the winter, but golf has become a fun, important part of my life. And that wouldn't be on YouTube. That'd mostly just be for like Instagram shit. If you guys seen some of the stuff I've done in there. And then obviously having like a cool section with like a podcast set up in a bar, a place you can bring people in, have discussions, do react, stuff like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about it. And I know, you know, 99% of you guys probably don't care. This is the behind the scenes stuff. Most people are just very interested in like, Hey, I pick up my phone. I want content. I want to consume and that's it. And we don't care how, <laughs> how it happens on the back end, But um I know there are a few of you that that might be interested in just my thought process and all this. And, you know, this all comes with me getting a little bit older. And I've thought recently too, um, you know, the streaming meta is kind of interesting. I, I've been streaming a little bit on YouTube off and on um, some of the body cam stuff, some of the live stuff. And I think there's this, there's this shift in attention towards people just really enjoying streaming for some reason. Obviously VODs are still going to do well, but the nature of attention and that's, I just think traditional, like, like 2017 through 2020 commentary video stuff that I kind of cut my teeth on that type of stuff. Doesn't, it just isn't the meta doesn't hit as much anymore. So I've, I've pivoted over the years on the main channel and doing different, you know, some body cam stuff. And I've done some, some more kind of like research commentary videos and always trying to get my footing. But I think my strength has always been just being on a mic early on. My other strength was the editing and, and some of the comedic timing around how I was editing these, these, uh, the videos. And it was like, part of it was planned. A lot of it was unscripted. And I think that's one of the things I love about the live piece is like, you can get just really funny, authentic moments, which is, I think what people 
really love. And even when I do VODs, you know, stuff that's not live, that will happen as well, even though it'll be a little bit more structured typically. But so I'm leaning just for main channel stuff. For those of you wondering, I think I'm going to be leaning into some more live streaming stuff and just being a little more culturally aware and relevant and part of the discourse that goes on, not necessarily politics per se, but just stuff I usually just see and keep it at arm's length. Cause I, I don't know. It's like, I just don't, there's a, there's an interesting part of me that loves the idea of just always having a YouTube business that's able to support me and my family and gives me the freedom that it does, which I'm so blessed to have, but that never gets me to the point where I'm, you know, in the spotlight more than I am now. I just I really value my ability to be able to turn off the the camera and just go home and and live a very normal private life. And I think any any time you start to get into things that are a little bit more less milk toast and a little more I don't know, controversial is not even the right word. It's like everything now that's not like a complete cop out fence setting position is like gonna get people pissed off. But anytime you just, the the bigger you grow, the more you build your brand and the more you talk about things that are culturally, culturally relevant and on people's minds, which obviously helps capture attention and helps grow your business, all these things, the more you, you just eventually get a target on your back from a, a percentage of people that are just going to hate you just for being you, which is like a something I've thought about because, you know, as much as I, I, I'm very comfortable with who I am in many ways. I just, I don't like the thought of people not liking me. I've just always been a people pleaser. And I've spoken about that in previous podcasts is how I was, uh, you know, a pretty insecure fat kid. And that is what got me into being, trying to be funny and comedy type of thing. Cause you're trying to fill this void of self-worth. And then that's always stayed with me. So as I've grown into an adult and I've come into my own and in, in many respects, I've definitely, um, that part of me still lives inside somewhere where it's like, yeah, I'm comfortable. Like I can deal with it. I don't need people to agree with me. And I, you know, I've, there's been plenty of times people have shit on me and said mean things on the internet. That's fine. I just don't, I hate the idea of going out of my way to push buttons because it gets attention. And that's like, that's, it feels like that's such a lucrative content model now. <laughs> where it's like, all you really have to do is take a hard line stance on something and just go hard in the paint day after day after day. And you can make so much fucking money because you're just going to get attention because it's either going to be the people that want to parrot what you're saying because they agree with you or the people that absolutely loathe you amplifying you because of how much they loathe you. So it's a bit of a paradox. Um, and so I've just kind of been doing a little introspection of, of what that's like for me. Cause initially I've, I've always wanted, you know, the two main reasons I got into making content to begin with, I would say after I left the band and was started to start do YouTube stuff and again, or got into more commentary style talking head stuff that wasn't music related in 2016 ish was to, was to entertain people and to try and find a way to make money outside of the restaurant. And I've been able to, and I've been successful at those two things. As much as I always feel like a bit of an imposter, I am very proud of what I've been able to accomplish. And now I'm just thinking about what that next iteration looks like for me. And I, I, you know, I think it's easy as you age to start to fall into things that are a little more divisive and obviously interests change. And you start, you know, I have, in the, I've had a kid who's now six years old in this time. You know, it feels like yesterday when I told you guys like, hey guys, I'm having a son. My wife's pregnant <laughs> in 2000. This was 2017, end of 2017, leading into 18. And it's like, God, man, where's the time go? You know, he's six. He's an absolute treasure. He's a treat. And it's like, I'm in dad mode most of the time now. And I'm thinking about all this stuff. And like a lot of people used to joke, a lot of you guys in the comments used to joke back in the, in the early, you know, 2017, 18 Nigel days when Nigel was much more prominent on the channel. Like, oh, imagine if you have a kid one day, he's going to grow up and see this. And like, I've always thought and considered that. And, you know, there's definitely some shit I was doing in the early days that I wouldn't do now. And it's like, certainly you could consider it embarrassing, but at the same time, going to maintain a certain level of pride around that era because it was like an attention at all costs kind of era. It was like, hey, I'm, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to try and figure it out. Sure, maybe it was a little cringe, but I found my stride, took a lot of practice. I did a lot of shit that didn't work. 
was able to find something that worked pretty well, stuck with it to a point where it changed my life, like drastically, hugely changed my life. And like still to this day. So I'm never going to be ashamed of any part of that process, but that, uh, but at the same time, it's like content has to grow with you. Otherwise it's going to eventually fall apart. So um, it has in some ways. And I think there's, there's other, you know, there's parts of my content that, 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 that have grown with me for sure. And then there's parts that I hold on to that I've held on to maybe a little longer than I should, just because they're, you know, part of a formula that I've kind of relied, relied on over the years. It's worked pretty well. So life at 39, my last year of my thirties before turning 40 next May is, is pretty sweet. You know, I think back to when I was 28, 29, I guess a decade ago now, I was dating my wife and I was leaving the band and we started, we were getting a little more serious and I just had no idea. Like you never know. That's one of the beautiful things I think about the part of your life where there's uncertainty. And I think so much of, so much of our lives is trying to quell the anxieties that come along with uncertainty. But on the flip side of that, a lot of the uncertainty in my life is a result of decisions I've made on purpose to do things that had a chance to work out well for me that just also could have gone extremely bad. You know what I mean? Like, so there's this, uh, this love hate relationship where, you know, some people really spend a lot of their life trying to, to keep things in order and to have a plan and to follow that plan and to avoid that feeling of uncertainty at all costs. But I think most of the the incredible things that have happened to me in my life over the last 10 years was a direct result of my willingness to make decisions that I knew were going to leave me with a whole lot of uncertainty and anxiety of not knowing what was going to happen in 12, 24, 36 months. And I thought at the time that that would get better. You know, I thought, you know, at the time I'm like, well, especially like when I figured it out, it's like, oh, okay, now like, now I have a few subscribers and there's people watching the videos and then it's like, oh, now I'm making a little bit of money and I'm like paying for my cell phone bill and like, holy shit, I, I had my first month, I made a thousand dollars and I, I, it's like paying part of my mortgage. Like, this is crazy. Like in all the way, all the while I'm thinking, you know, you're going to reach this point where it's like, you've figured it out. Now you've boom, you've hit your stride and that's it. Like no more uncertainty, no more. What the fuck's going on? I've figured it out. We've done it. And then all of a sudden I've, I leave my job because things are going well. And then a couple of years later, I, my wife leaves her job and she's a stay at home mom to be with our son. And all the while I'm like, one of these days, <laughs> I'm not going to wake up every morning. Absolutely fucking miffed at what the fuck's going on. And I'm just scared. It'll be figured out. I'm not going to be anxious or nervous that next year, everything's going to be different and crazy. And I finally was like, you know what? Maybe that's literally the name of the game is you just have to figure out a way to cope with being horrifically uncertain and anxious at all times. <laughs> and that could be a personality trait too. You know, I obviously like some people are very thrive in the chaos, you know, and some people really need law and order in their life in a lot of ways. And, and these are things people need to figure out for themselves. But I think I've always, I've always felt that I, I needed some sort of kind of like law and order and this, this kind of strict plan I could follow. But what I've learned is that I think I thrive a little bit in the chaos and uncertainty and whatever that means for you guys, I'm not sure. I'm just thinking about my own life, but it's helped me. It, it's helped me just think about that and process that idea that, you know what, um, probably in another 10 years when I'm 49 going on 50, like right now I think, oh yeah, like I'm going to hit this milestone in my forties. I'm going to have this figured out. I'll have this amount, you know, th this is going to happen with my family. I'll have this amount of money. Like, I'll, you know, you make all these things like, then it's going to be bing, bang, boom. Yeah. Sweet. Then I can take a breath and I know I'm going to tend I'm going to be 49 going on 50 being like, oh man, whew. but that's part of the beauty of it, right? Like maybe that's just a symptom of like, just, I don't know, like the second you have it figured out or you become complacent, that's, that's when you get punched in the fucking face, right? Like I feel like you always, you just need to be on your toes a little bit at all times because at any given moment, mother nature or the good Lord or whoever it is you think orchestrates your life could pull the rug out on you.
you know, and you got to be able to adapt. You got to be able to twinkle toes, baby, dance around a little bit. Cause I'm, and so you're, you're, so I'm feel like this, this feeling of like always waiting for the other shoe to drop. It sucks. Cause it's kind of like just this constant tension. that's always existing as you're crafting your life and writing your story, but it's a necessary tension to, I think, make sure you don't get super complacent. And that goes for anything. That's like occupational business wise. That's family relationships. Like ultimately uh, for me, it's just like, Hey man, like I have my vices and I'm constantly engaging in behaviors that aren't getting me closer to my goals, but at least I'm always like, there's always a voice like nagging me. So like it's balancing the scales in the other direction a little bit. You know, there's some people that are just like that, they're workaholic, that's what they do. Like they're super successful. All they care about is money, money and success and, and work and whatever. And I've always been a very big advocate for balance. Um, I think different, you know, in different times of your life, it's going to be different. I think some certain times of your life is going to be imbalanced and it's going to be necessary when you're building things and maybe a relationship, a certain part, certain period of time in your relationship is going to take a little more work. Other times it's going to feel a little bit easier, but a pursuit of balance and just a, an unyielding tension of like, hey, this, we could be doing something. We could be working on something that's going to get us a little bit closer to what we think is the ideal, the ideal place to be in life. So just some thoughts I've been thinking about, you know, back to the, the DJT, the, the, the Joe Rogan podcast. I'm curious. I mean, shit, the election by the, this is going to be out. The election is going to be in like a week, eight or nine days. I don't know what's going to happen, man. I just, I'm probably going to vote for the first time this year in a long time. I have a lot of mixed feelings about a lot of things, but I have my beliefs about life. I have my values. I have my core values. And, you know, it's just one of those things where we are all um, ultimately, you know, subject to a, a two-party system and you have to just, everyone's going to do what they feel is best for them. And that's fine, you know? I have a, I look at life a certain way. I, I look at life through a certain lens that is is a result of how I was raised and all my life experience and some of the values that I hold dear and the family that I have and the economic situation. I mean, all these different things. Who has who I am as who I am as a person and like all all that's going to inform how I feel about the world and what I think is the best you know the best solution for my future, my kids' future, whatever in this country that has changed so great, you know, so drastically in the last 10, 20 years, but every, you know, everywhere as it's not just the United States, the, the world is changing in a lot of ways. And it does feel sometimes a little bit dire, I think is a side effect of overexposure to all of the world's information at all times. It's very easy for it to feel super dire. And I know you know, that bleeds into people's opinions of one another. And then it just becomes a very tribalistic, chest thumping battle between camps that is like tearing apart families and like causing violence and protests. And it's just like, man, like at the end of the day, I, I can't get over this idea that, you know, so much of what everybody wants is, is, is the same thing. And I guess it's just, Everyone has their own way of getting there, but everyone wants to like, you know, there's just people need to feel love and acceptance and companionship and people want to feel safe. People want to feel like they have equal opportunity. People want like whatever it is, there's all these different things, but that's a, that looks different for everybody, you know, kind of like, I think one thing that's happened in this country is just a, a there's been definitely a, a big diversion away from kind of classic conservative values, whatever that might mean. And it's turned into a little bit of this hedonistic, like whatever feels good. Like I am my own master. I am my own God type of mentality. I think we're kind of seeing the result of that. And, you know, I'm in a weird place because I, as you guys know, I, I have very conservative values and I was raised in a, in a Christian home, but I've become pre agnostic as an adult. So I'm not like doing all of these things for the glory of some higher power, but I also at the same time appreciate the value and the necessity of having a value system that puts importance on having a purpose outside of yourself. And I think the farther we stray away from that, I think it, it starts to get a little bit dire. So I don't know, for, for me, it's like, even though I might not believe in certain theological things and what happens after you die and all these things, I still think it's valuable 
to live a life in service of a greater thing than just hedonism in your own needs and wants in fleshy desires. So that puts me in a weird spot because, you know, so, so many, so many of, I feel like so much of, so many of the people I align with in a lot of ways that have like more conservative values just around family um, and things like that. Um, we would probably disagree in many ways on, on theology and why we do those things. And, and sometimes I wonder why I do this. things. a lot of the things, a lot of the things that I value come from that kind of, Christian conservative system I was I was raised in and I think what I've I've really grappled with as an adult where a lot of these things I was taught was like well this is what's right it's for the glory of God it's for you know it's because it's it's good it's it's not sinful it's like you need to behave x y and z because it's you know you need to behave in the image of Christ or however you think you know all of these things. And I'm like, okay, so if you take away that reason for doing it, then what reason do you have for behaving in a way that is laden with values, self-sacrifice and things that I typically consider traits of a high value individual or somebody that I respect or and admire. And I think it boils down to just wanting to live life in a fulfilling way. It's never been more evident that when we lose sight of living life in a way that it, that has self-sacrifice in a way that is putting importance on things outside of our own you know needs and desires we only think about us and our needs and our wants how much i can get how much i can gain you start to see how that is just people start to fall apart it's like all of a sudden it starts to unravel I think humans in general innately need some sort of, they need some sort of higher purpose than just self-aggrandizement. I truly do. And in a non-religious front, simply for, sim simply in pursuit of living a life that feels good and is fulfilling, right? <laughs> like there's pleasures of the flesh and then there's what I, you know, quick pleasures that, that feel bad, you know, drugs, uh, uh, infidelity, like all these things you see glorified in our modern day culture, in the movies, on his social media, like all of these like hedonistic wants and needs, just like, oh, every, it feels good right now. So I'm just going to do that. When in, for me, real joy and happiness comes from the ability to abandon those things in pursuit of something that is much more difficult and takes much more sacrifice to get, which I don't know what that is exactly. It's different for everybody. But I think those are the journeys that really give people joy. And I think that's getting lost. I truly do. And I don't, you know, I'm on a bit of a tangent, a little bit of a rabbit hole here. It's a little bit apolitical, but these are some of the things I think about when I look at the landscape of the partisan system and what people are constantly screaming about. And I think I just... I'm like, I watch it. I see it happening. I make my own conclusions around certain things uh, that I guess are probably pretty controversial online. But I always come back to this, this idea that no matter what happens, you know, like it's up to me to be the puppet master of my own life. I need to orchestrate the life that I want and, and nobody else is going to do that. No politician, no leader, None of that. And I think so many people get so wrapped up in it and they think that if this person doesn't get elected or if this happens, it's like their life is over. It's the end of the world. It's fascism. It's communism. It's like, nah, dude, like, no, like we're not, we're still living pretty, I don't know. Like it's, like it, I think it's going to be okay. But people have a tendency to only focus on the bad and the negative at all times. And it's like, it's very easy when you when you go down that rabbit hole of just constantly being persuaded to think only of the worst possible outcomes and scenarios and you're constantly being manipulated by algorithms to get emotional reactions out of yourself. It's so easy to just spend all of your emotional energy on that instead of spending it on being someone that orchestrates a life that you love and appreciate and are proud of. So for me, I don't know what the next couple months are going to look like. I'm going to take a couple weeks, I think, to to gather my thoughts and continuing to uh, advise and be part of the the Storyfire team as we try and build that platform and 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 make it better and make it a place where people can 
be excited to share their life and to share content and be introduced to, to Web3 and get a little taste of digital tokens and socialify. Tangentially, I'll speak. I, I've been super in the trenches lately with just crypto in general on like Solana and Base. I, any of you guys who know this, what I'm talking about, just like fucking around with meme coins, like just looking at the ecosystem there, just seeing this, what I call tokenized attention where, you know, it's it's very easy from the outside looking in to just think, oh, well, everything's a fucking scam. And it's like, well, it's weird because the 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 attention or the narrative has shifted where like, you know, the last bull market 20, 2020, 21, it was like, oh, meme coins were a scam because they're intrinsically valueless, but oh, these, these utility tokens and these, you know, these DeFi platforms that are being funded by VCs that are getting tokens for cents on a dollar. Those are the real coins because they offer value, but really it's just like, you eventually get dumped on by the big VCs that fucking make a 300 X and all retail gets crushed. And the beauty about kind of this meme coin craze of this current cycle is it's just mask off. It's tokenized attention. It's like, there's a fixed supply. There's no insiders or certainly for some there are, but it's just fucking hyper gambling on attention. And it's like, if you can, if you can buy in early on a coin and you're good enough to somehow be part of that community and pump attention and it hundred X is good for you. It's fucking crazy. So there's like, I don't, it's just been fun to see and get a little bit closer in insight into this part of the crypto industry, which I think is still very niche. You know, most people, if you ask, they're like, oh, they know what Bitcoin is and Ethereum is, but they're not, they're not in the fucking Solana trenches on like Photon, like, like banging around with like 10K market cap shitters, you know, just getting rugged every third one, but finding winners every fifth. It's a fucking crazy, it's like a new, it's a, it's like a new age casino open to everybody, but it's not just like sitting there clicking buttons like XQC and like watching this cool little slot machine spin. And maybe I won or not. No, you're just straight PVP and other motherfuckers trying to pull that shit out before it goes to zero. And don't get me wrong. I'm still fully, I still fully am invested in the future of just blockchain technology in general. This is one microcosm of this financialization of memes and attention that has been really cool. But I think there's a million other, you know, a million other use cases that are more valid. They just take a lot longer to mature, especially as they start to infiltrate the legacy financial systems anyways. So that's where a lot of my attention is banned. And, you know, that's, I think as we go into the election, I think about how policy will affect the future of that. I think it's just inevitable. I think Bitcoin, I think at this point, if you are someone who has a 401k or you have some sort of, uh, you know, investment vehicle, you're fortunate enough to have some savings and some, some investments. I think if you don't have a, at least a small percentage in Bitcoin, I think you're silly, but that's just my opinion. That's just one old man's opinion. And that's, you know, that's just the passive way to do it. I just, I think it's just fun being in there with fucking on the DEXs, trading coins, fucking around with meme coins. It's funny, man. It's a whole different world on crypto Twitter. I'll tell you. And my attention is pulled in so many places as I like try to keep up with what's going on on YouTube. I'm on crypto Twitter all day. It's just, uh, it's been a ride. But um, I've really enjoyed having the opportunity to to speak a little bit more openly and candidly. And, and, I, and I plan on continuing to do that. So as I take a break to get a little bit of clarity going into the winter and try to capitalize on some things I was talking about with um, maybe finding some warehouse space to to grow and progress what the content's going to look like from this channel and my other channels over the next couple of years. Uh, I just want to give you one last thanks for, for being around for it, whether you, you know, you've been here from day one or you just started listening recently. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to be able to, to have you here for a couple conversations, 29 so far. And I look forward to some more in the future. Um, and I just want to, I just want to say thanks for being a part of that in whatever capacity you've been a part of it. And I hope that in some way I can continue to provide you value. And if I don't, that's okay too. And I know you're going to be fine. You're going to do just great. And I hope to see you around sometime. <laughs> so thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you soon. Until then, be good. Enjoy the fall, the winter, the holidays, whatever the fuck. I don't care. I love you. Peace.